I heard of. <laughs> so that's good. Good morning. Good morning. For those who don't know me, my name is Gwen Balke. I'm a retired United Methodist pastor. And thank you for having me today. It's always a joy to be here. And uh, it's a joy because the sun is trying to shine. So let us come together, gather, and worship God. Please join me in the reading of your vision statement. God's timeless love transforms each of us to joyously continue the ministry of Jesus Christ in our community and in our world. Come all who are poor in spirit. Come all who mourn. Come all who are meek. Come all who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Come all who would be merciful. Come all who would be pure in heart. Come all who would be peacemakers. Let us come together, the weak, the simple, the powerless, the foolish. Let us worship the God of every blessing. Loving God, we come this morning seeking to abide in your presence. Open our minds to your spirit of wisdom, that we may know how to live as your people. Open our hearts to your spirit of truth, that we may love all your people with a love that speaks of justice, kindness, and radical grace. Amen. Let us continue with our worship. And join together and come. Christians join to sing. Page 267. Forgive us our gluttony, 
Blessed are the poor in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Forgive us for waging war. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the realm of heaven. Forgive us for not taking a stand. Let us spend a moment in silence confessing our sins. Rejoice and be glad. Blessed are those who seek the face of God. Everyone who asks, receive, and the one who seeks, finds. Blessed are those who ask for forgiveness, for they shall be forgiven. Blessed are those who repent, for they shall be free to live fully in the present. Thanks be to God.
children to come up for a little message, please. Oh, I've got a helper. He knows I need a, mic he knows I need a microphone holder. We're trying to get the um, handle list, is that what you call it? And it wasn't working. So I said, I got to read a book here to these kids this morning. I need my hands. So Michael is going to be assisting. Here he is. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see all of you this morning. We're going to hear about the Beatitudes this morning. Pastors, Pastor Wen is going to read a passage from the Bible, and I'm actually going to help her out and do a little bit of that. Before we get started, I want to talk about the Beatitudes. And look at B. It's a part of it. And another part of it is attitude. And I think what Jesus is telling his people when he's preaching to them on the mountain is he wants us to be happy and joyful because all of these verses start with the word blessed. And did you know that another interpretation of that is happy? Did you know that? Well, what's another word for happy? What's another word for happy? How about joy? Is that another word for happy? Yeah. This is a book I bought when I was on vacation in New York City. And it's about two kids. And they live in very different places. And they're really, really trying hard to be happy. Sometimes it's difficult to be happy all the time. And I want you to think about what can you do every day so that you can have a happy day and that life will be good. Yes, you have a question? Maybe that like when you could be like, I just put a smile on your face because it's not so good. I think that's a wonderful idea. I love that idea. Put a smile on your face. That's a good thing to do. Now, I want to read, can I read the story too? What, do you have a question? You just wanted to raise your hand, I'll bet. That's what you wanted to do. You like it when the sun shines? Does it make you happy? I love it, I love it. So, this is about children, and one of us grew up in a little house. So this one lives in a little house. These are two boys that are talking. One of us grew up in a great big house. So see how big his house? They're really, really different. One house, our houses were on opposite sides of the world. So here's the great big world, and one house is up here, and one house is way down here. So even though they live very different, they were very much the same. Often, we were sad and lonely. Both of us wished for a friend. Did you ever have that happen where you wish you had a friend? You kind of sad, you kind of lonely? Sometimes the other kids wouldn't let us play. That would make them sad. Or they were very far away. You ever have friends that are very far away and you can't play together? Like maybe when they're on vacation or you're busy? We wondered if we would always be sad and lonely. What do you suppose they could do that? So they weren't sad and lonely. Jesus wants us to be happy and But when we sat still, Sometimes we just have to sit still and breathe. Sometimes we listen to the quiet. We noticed something beautiful. So when you have times when you're maybe sad and lonely, sometimes you just sit and you, and you breathe and you're quiet and you think. If you just focus on the thing that is making you sad, then you'll be sad. But if you look around, you will see that there is joy 
everywhere. Joy is the warm, tingly feeling that you get when the sun is shining. We just talked about that, how we feel going to bed when the sun is shining. It's the giggly, squiggly feeling when you are doing something silly. You ever do that? How silly times when you just feel giggly and squiggly? And it's the soft, snuggly times. Cozy, going to sleep at night. And even when you are caught up in the rain. And you still have fun. Do you splash in the puddles and it gets kind of squiggly and giggly and fun? Well, even if you slam the door, sometimes slam the door because you're kind of not too happy about something, joy can't get in. It's just on the other side waiting for you. It's waiting for a loving hug. And even if there is a loud noise, <gasps> what is that? Thunder. Lightning, and when there's lightning, there's usually thunder. Does that get kind of scary sometimes? Yeah. Well, you can still be joyful. You can still be happy. There's still a silvery moon that comes out, so happy times. Joy is the bubbly, bouncy feeling of finding a good friend. So when you find a good friend, you can be happy. <clears throat> and once you let that joy in, just like magic, your heart is always going to have room for more. So you can never get too much joy. There's just always room for more and more and more and more. We discovered that the more joy we shared, the more joy we had. And the more joy we have, the more joy we share. So the story we want today is that we remember to be joyful. So will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together today to think about being blessed and to sharing joy. Bless us each and every one. Amen. Thank you for coming up today. As we prepare to listen to first the psalm and then the gospel, dear God, be with us and open our ears and open our hearts so that we are able to hear what you want us to hear and learn what you want us to learn. In Jesus' name, amen. Our re reading from the Psalm 15 this morning is found on page 655 in your Bible, in your pew, pew Bible here. Six. I guess I wasn't ready for that. 655. <laughs> this is a psalm of um, how to be holy, or who may worship the Lord, it says. We, let's read this together. It's not very long, so let's read it together. Who may stay in God's temple or live on the holy mountain of the Lord? Only those who God do as they should. They seek the truth and don't spread gossip and change others fairly. page 1142, what we're going to do, um, you use what is called the Contemporary English Version, and I looked up about it. It is not a paraphrase. It is an interpretation of the Bible as it was originally written, 
I want you to hear the contrast or just the way different Bibles will, will, will interpret what is said. And Dory's going to help me with that. I'm going to read one of the Beatitudes. I think you probably figured out by now that we're talking about the Beatitudes today. Um, and then she'll read it in the contemporary English version. So this is the introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God blesses those people who depend only on him. They belong to the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. God blesses those people who grieve. They will find comfort. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. God blesses those people who are humble. The earth will belong to them. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be fulfilled. God blesses those people who want to obey him more than to eat or drink. They will be given what they want. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those people who are merciful. They will be treated with mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. God blesses those people whose hearts are pure. They will see him. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. God blesses those people who make peace. They will be called his children. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God blesses those people who are treated badly for doing right. They belong to the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. God, let me reverse that. Thank you very much. I'm going to be really close to that camera, aren't I? I think we won't have my face. We'll just have my voice. That might be frustrating to the... Hi, everybody watching. But this way, you'll actually probably be able to hear me better at uh, home. Now, I'm going to do some teaching again, as I did last week just to kind of emphasize some of the things that we talked about. Now, there are two places in the Gospels which have the Beatitudes. Do you know what they are? Matthew and Luke. That's right. We're probably most familiar with Luke, but I think in, in listening to the Beatitudes and reading them numerous times over the week, we kind of enter change some of their meanings with each other and come out with our own interpretation of it. A couple of the differences, the uh, Beatitudes in Matthew are spoken from the mountain. In Luke, they're known as spoken during the Sermon on the Plain. Jesus is up in the mountain in Matthew. Jesus is on a lower level in Luke. Now, once again, as we talked about last week, different writer, different audience. Matthew writes to the Jewish people who would understand righteousness. And you're going to hear that word several times during the rest of the sermon, righteousness. And they would know what that means, and they would know that God expected them to obey. Well, Luke writes to the Gentiles, non-Jews. And he focuses more on the humanness of Jesus. So if you look at the 
um, Beatitudes in Luke, they are focused more on what humans do, on the humanness of people. So that's kind of, again, showing the different focuses of the gospel writers. Now today in Matthew, well, just to give a, what I call setting the stage, last week Jesus called the first four disciples using the word, follow me. Then Jesus went throughout Galilee, and he taught in the synagogues, and he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom, and he healed every disease and sickness among the people, and the news about him had spread all over. Well, one day Jesus saw the crowds who were following him, and he went up the mountain and began to speak to his disciples. Now, as I read this, or as any time you read the Bible, there, I, I, there are questions that come forward. You know, what does that mean? When he talks about disciples, who's he talking about? Is he talking about the 12? Or is he talking about everybody who follows him? Also, why did he go up the mountain? In order to teach. Maybe he actually wanted to escape, but they followed him anyway. He wanted some alone time, but the people were so interested in what he had been doing, they followed him. Now, Jesus was a rabbi, and rabbis at that time sat when they preached. So on a mountainside, if Jesus sat, then he could see all the people that were lower than him. And they probably sat too. Now, when I was in Israel, um, we did go to what they call the Mount of the Beatitudes. And it's really not that high. Um, I'm trying to think around here. It probably, oh, it's a little bit higher, but it comes up from the Sea of Galilee. Um, you know, going up the the hill going out of North Redwood up the hill, probably a little bit taller than that, but it wasn't a huge, huge mountain. So Jesus was sitting up there and the people were just all around him going down the sides of the mountain. Now I didn't ask the, answer the question about what the disciples were, who the disciples were. It was probably both. It was probably the disciples, the 12 that Jesus had called and other people who were following Jesus. Um, that begs the question, was everybody called a disciple? What's the difference between a disciple and an apostle? Well, a person Oh, I have to explain Luke first so I can get into this. If you have time today, go and read Luke, the Beatitudes in Luke. Jesus had been performing miracles and healing, and at that point, he was already having interactions with the Pharisees. They were already beginning to plot against him. Now, Matthew hadn't gotten to that point yet, but Luke had. And when Jesus just decided in Luke that he needed a break, he needed time alone, he needed time with God, so he went up to the mountainside to pray. And he spent the night praying. And then when morning came, he called his disciples and chose 12 of them, whom he designated as apostles. That's where the word apostles come in. Then he went down the mountain and stood on a level place with a great crowd around him. So, what is the difference between a disciple and an apostle? Does anybody know? Well, in Kenya, when I remember when I was there visiting my missionary friend, she worked with five Kenyans, five Kenyan people, and they had it was amazing. They had five, they belonged to five different churches. They came from five different tribes. They had five different gifts. 
but they all work together. Their gifts were that of teacher, hospitality, working with children, administration, and profit. But they called Karen the apostle. The apostle. It was her specific mission to help them spread the word of Jesus Christ. Apostles are specifically selected for a specific mission in the New Testament. An apostle is a disciple, but a disciple is not necessarily an apostle. Disciples, we're all disciples of Jesus Christ, but we all have our different missions. And the 12 were also apostles. So, kind of, you, can, you can see how you can get off the track if you're studying the Bible, at least I do, because you read this and you go, oh, what does that mean? Oh, what does that mean? Oh, what does that mean? And, you know, and you never have gone and looked at what you were really reading. Well, in order to explain the Beatitudes in a, in a more, in a different manner, I'm just going to say the differences between Matthew and Luke. In Matthew, there are eight Beatitudes, but you might say, no, there are nine. Some, some scholars will say that. The difference is in the last saying, and if you look at it, it did not say, blessed are they. It says, blessed are you. So even in reading the Bible, you have to pay attention to the pronouns how they're being used, and who they're talking to and about. So we have eight, blessed are they. And all of a sudden, Jesus says, blessed are you. We'll talk about that later. Luke has four Beatitudes. They're equivalent to Matthew's first, fourth, second, and ninth. And then if you look at Luke, you'll see there are also woes. Each positive Beatitude has a woe that follows it. Um, in Matthew, the blessings, except the last one, are attached to spiritual qualities, realities. And in Luke, it's more about the external conditions of poverty and suffering and physical qualities. For example, in Matthew, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Condition promise. In Luke, blessed are you, different pronoun there, who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. And woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Again, a physical. So, the Beatitudes in Matthew are more spiritual. The Beatitudes in Luke are more physical, human, and so on. And finally, the last definition, um, Beatitudes, blessed. Um, blessed comes from the Latin word for blessing. And as Dory said, when we, when we think about that, joy comes to mind. So being blessed is to experience true happiness, true hope, true joy. But here's the part about it. That is independent of all the chances of life, no matter what happens to you. So your inner joy, your joy in being blessed in the Beatitudes has nothing to do if you're loved one is passing away and you feel sad, yes, but you still have that inner joy and that inner peace that is only in Jesus Christ. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, enough of, enough of that. But one thing about preaching or preparing a sermon, and you, will prob you probably know this or do this, is that it's a learning process. Um, sometimes I learn more from my sermons than I think the people do. 
And sometimes I think I'm preaching to myself more than I am to you. But I had a sermon basically all done, and it just didn't feel right. It didn't feel like, no, this isn't what I want to convey. So put that away, save that for another time. Did something different. After reading different interpretations of the Bible, different commentaries, I came up with something different. I feel it was more Holy Spirit guided than the first one was. Well, as you know, the Beatitudes are statements of characteristics and blessings for us as disciples to follow. These scriptures encourage us, give us hope as we face each day, knowing that we are blessed. No matter your age, your job, or your family role, if you apply the Beatitudes to your life, you will experience a joyful, fulfilled life. Most scholars agree that the Beatitudes give us a picture of the true discipleship of God. One thing I read and I didn't really explore much was what some scholars think that this, the Beatitudes in the New Testament mere, well not mere, but are like the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. That, well, they were both given on mountains. But that the Ten Commandments were given to the people at that time, telling them how to live. And some scholars think the Beatitudes in the New Testament were given to the disciples, telling them how to live as believers. So that's one way to look at it. Um, another way is, remember when I spoke how Jesus addresses his audience in Matthew, that he seems to be talking about others, that he's talking about they, them, theirs, not really talking about you, like, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Or God blesses those people who depend only on him. They belong to the kingdom of heaven. Just when Jesus' disciples, those who want to know more about him, think Jesus is talking about somebody else, what happens? The final beatitude addresses them. The disciples, those who are listening, they're sitting there probably going, eh, Jesus isn't talking about me, he's talking about them. Then all of a sudden, Jesus says, blessed are you. Blessed are you. What's going on there? Well, let's look at a couple of the Beatitudes. And we're only going to look at a couple of them, and as this popped into my mind, that I'm going to let, there's a couple I want to talk about, but I'm going to let you pick one or two that you want to know more about. So open up your Bible, if it's not open, Matthew 5, 1 through 12, and um, see if there's one you want to do a little more digging into. Like I said, I'm not going to do them all. I'm not going to talk about them all. So if one happens to uh, stick out that you want to know some more about in Matthew 5, 1 through 12, we can talk about a couple of those. Anybody have one? And you'll have to read it to me. God bless those people who want to obey him more than eat or drink. They will be given what they want. Ah, okay. Have to find that. What I would have read are blessed those are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now in this, hunger and thirst speak of this deep need and driving passion. This is where they talk about righteousness. Righteousness refers to Jesus Christ. We try to be righteous and act like Jesus Christ. When they talk about to be filled here, this deals with the satisfaction of your soul's desire. It doesn't deal with um, 
eating or drinking. Now, I know it says that in the CEV. It says, God blesses those people who want to obey him more than to eat or drink. Well, no, that does. It says, they want to obey him more than they want to eat or drink. This isn't about physically eating or drinking. This is about having the desire of wanting to obey Christ more than you even want to eat or drink. To hunger and thirst for righteousness means loving what God loves and taking a stand against what he hates. Christians often do this by peacefully protesting unjust laws or participating in worthy causes or standing up for people who are persecuted or bullied. I remember, I, I, this story is, is so profound to me in many ways that I sometimes probably have already shared this, but when I was in Washington, D.C., I worked in the executive office of the mayor of the city. And this was in the 70s. And one of the people we had hired to run the Xerox machine. Now, you have to remember, this is in the 70s. The Xerox machines were this big or bigger. And we had a person, their sole job was to Xerox anything anybody wanted. And a lot of it was putting together the um, booklets for the city council meetings. So there was a lot of Xeroxing. And the young lady who had this job was schizophrenic. And when she would go off her meds, it was not good. It was not good. And it was usually my immediate boss's job and mine to get her admitted to the hospital. Um, I fought for her job. I always fought for her job. I would tell her, you know what? Yes, yeah, she's schizophrenic. But when she's on her meds, she's the best person there is for doing this job. So please don't fire her. Please don't, you know, get rid of her. Laws back then weren't as uh, like they are nowadays. You could just say, sorry. Um, and the sad thing to me is that when I left D.C., they did get rid of her. But I was always there protecting her job. And that's what Jesus wants us to do, is to stick up for other people, to help those that are hungry and who are thirsty, and to, to bless them ourselves. Now, let me get back to this. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are those who admit, this is where this comes in, who admit their need for it, who admit their need for Jesus. In other words, they see that in the situations of life, they do not have it within themselves to do things righteously. But when they go and speak to the master, the master, Jesus, is there to bless us and fill us up with what we need. So another way to say it, our blessed are those who passionately long for Jesus, for he will satisfy their souls. I don't know if that said it or not, but that's kind of one. Okay, does anybody else have one? God blesses those people who are humble. The earth will belong to them. It's kind of similar to the one before that about blessed are the meek. But in this case, blessed are those people who are humble, who submit themselves to God's authority 
and make him the Lord of their life. Now being humble or being meek, and I always feel this is important to stress, does not mean you let people abuse you, walk over you. You're not a doormat to anybody. Because Jesus had some harsh things to say about people who acted like that. This was in Luke. He said that it would be better for abusers to have millstones thrown around their necks. True meekness, when he talks about being meek or being humble, means practicing selflessness and humility. It means that you get your strength from God, not from yourself. It means to be quiet when you should be quiet, but to be bold when you should be bold. To stop putting yourself first and making God's will your first priority. It's about putting God first. It means that, sure, it means that you make sure that you're not filling yourself with so many other things that you can't hear what God is telling you to do. So all that other stuff that goes on in your head, you need to get out and listen to what God has to say. So in humility, you submit yourself to God and you will inherit everything he possesses. Anybody else have a burning desire to hear about one? Because I, I do want to talk to a couple, about a couple that bother me. Um, Let me see. How about blessed are those who mourn, for they will find comfort. They will be comforted. This is often misinterpreted. We often think this means those who lost a loved one to death or some great tragedy. But in this case, those who mourn speaks of those who express deep sorrow over sin. This has to do with sin. This has to do with repentance. This has to do with the forgiveness of sin and the joy of eternal salvation that you receive when you repent. Think about not just the consequences of your sins, but sometimes don't the sins keep happening, the same ones over and over again? I know for me, I have a couple of those that are like, yeah, oh God, forgive me, and then you go do it anyway. <laughs> or do you mourn over the fact that you desire to good, to do good, but it doesn't always happen? You know, I, I want to do good. I want to be good, but it doesn't always happen. I have this example, I think, get this off my chest, I'll feel better about it. Um, <laughs> This happened at um, Budmobile. Um, there's this woman who lives in Montevideo. I don't know her from beans, but she knew who I was. And she kind of attached herself to me. And she comes every once in a while to the Budmobile in Redwood. And the last time she was there, not this month, or not, yeah, but the time before. When she got up to leave, she fainted. And I was, like, not too far from behind. Well, I was behind her, but she fainted and, and fell to the floor and cut her eye and twisted her glasses. And, but by the time I got there, there were already two people there that worked for the Budmobile, you know, helping her out. Now, the good thing for me to have done was I could have said, oh, I know who she is. I'll take her to the hospital or to the ER emergency or um, same day, whatever. But I didn't. I thought to myself, I have things to do. <laughs> I also thought to myself, 
after I give blood, I don't, I like to just rest for a while because I don't want to be the one fainting. Um, I have really good excuses. Um, I don't really know her that well. She just knows me. So I walked out to my car, <laughs> left her lying there on the floor with two people, with two people. And I got out to the car and I'm like, oh, Quinn, you have to go back. That is just not Christian of you not to help this person out. I also thought to myself, why is she coming all the way from Montevideo? <laughs> but um, when I got there, there was even another person helping out. So I just asked how, it, how she was doing, and the head of the blood mobile um, said, well, I'm going to take her to the emergency room. So I was like, Whew. And I went back out to my car and drove away. Now, was that very Christian of me? No. It wasn't. And it still bugs me sometimes that I wasn't more helpful to that lady, but I had my excuses. So, I still haven't really said to God, you know, God, I'm really sorry I did that. Because I really did have some good excuses, but I don't think God buys that. Um, so that's what this was about. This is about being sincere and honest in your repenting. You mourn because you need to repent, and you repent of your sins, and you ask for God's forgiveness. And you're sincere. You're sincere. And that leads to comfort and knowing you are forgiven. And that leads to obedience in Christ and salvation in Christ. So blessed are those who mourn for their sins, for they shall receive forgiveness and eternal life. I think we'll just kind of skip these other ones because last I realized last week I looked at my watch and it said like or my phone and it said 1015 and I'm like, oh I got another 15 minutes. I forgot you started 1015. <laughs> um, so I just want to close with oh there's some really good ones, but I want to just kind of say something more about um, the last the ninth one. Some people don't consider it a beatitude, but others do. That's blessed are you. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Can you imagine how odd this was for everyone to hear? Can you picture yourself on, on sitting on the mountain, beautiful day, when it's beautiful in Israel, it's like a summer day here, it's just gorgeous. And you're sitting there and you're listening to Jesus and he's talking about everybody else. He's going, and they will be blessed and those who, and all of a sudden Jesus says, and you are blessed, when? I can just imagine sitting there going, you've got to be kidding. All of a sudden you're talking about me. I was enjoying you talking about everybody else. Well, Jesus is saying that they're going to be facing persecution. Now up to this point, Matthew hasn't said a lot about that. Luke has said a lot more. But Jesus knows what is coming. And he says, the way of the world says that if something bad is happening to, to you, it's because there's something bad that you have done. But that's not what Jesus says. He says you may be persecuted for following and obeying the Son of God. You may suffer for being lovely, for being holy, for being truthful, for being good, for being humble, for being righteous. However, the blessing that comes from this persecution is twofold. First, you will be considered like one of the prophets who are the great heroes of faith. And second, you will receive a reward in heaven. 
because you endured for Christ. By suffering now, you will be rewarded greatly later. So the people of Jesus' day would have heard Jesus tell them to prepare for the coming of the kingdom of heaven. Upon hearing that, they would have surely wondered how they must live to prepare for that kingdom. So what Jesus is giving them on the Sermon of the Mount is telling them how to be followers of God and how they must live. And that's what this is about for us too. This is how we must live. We must understand that in order to find any of these blessings, in order to live this way, we must be in Christ. We can't live as God requires us to do on our own. We can't experience blessings on our own. We need Christ. We need Jesus. We need to follow him in the ways of God and not in the ways of the world. And then we will be blessed. Amen. Let us join together and sing, Help Us Accept Each Other, 754. And please stand. the faith of our baptism. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, our only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sit up at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. 
Um, Sonia has an announcement. Hi, good morning. Um, on Saturday, February 18th, our church will be hosting the Presbytery meeting for the Minnesota Valley Presbytery. Uh, they told me to expect about 60 people, so it's not a huge crowd. Generally, Pastor Scott is pretty much responsible for arranging all of the workers and everything, but since he's ill, or recovering, I should say, um, the session is taking on that responsibility. So for that day, um, we will be serving a meal, um, and uh, there's other jobs, there's ushering jobs, communion serving jobs, which I think Dave has handled, and uh, other duties, just general cleanup hosting duties. So um, take a look at your calendars. It's really a fun day. Uh, there'll be a good meal. I will prepare it. Um, so <laughs> enjoy a meal uh, with us. And, um, and But it's a Saturday, so I know that, that people have busy schedules. Anyway, I know that like Michael and Nick and I and Dave will probably be trying to recruit you. Um, so uh, I just kind of wanted to make an announcement if you're available that day and can help let one of us know or anybody on the session. Otherwise, we might be giving you a call or don't run away when we walk up to you. That's, that's all that I'm worried about. So um, thank you for your consideration. Any other announcements? I was going to announce about you. Maybe this is going to be your announcement. but. Your service next week will be conducted by Adrian, so that'll be good. Hey, uh, one thing I was going to warn you, it had been billed kind of like Gwen would be here all the time, but she's not available next week, so you're stuck with me. So I didn't want anybody to show up and be disappointed, you're forewarned. But uh, really, I wanted to say that I see the breakfast, or not the breakfast, the youth club meal sign up is still needs to be filled out, and it was so wonderful. In the fall, it just got filled out, you know, kind of everybody took a turn, and it was great to see the kids blessed that way. So if you haven't noticed it and you are able to, just go ahead and put your name sometime this spring, and that would be wonderful. Thank you. Oh, what a wonderful word, spring. Yes. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Just want to remind everyone about our card crusade for Tina, and we'll be taking through next Sunday, so we appreciate if you get in on that, and I uh, got the Sunday school students involved in a little project for her too, so we hope all goes well and we can surprise her with that. Anybody else? Any joys, concerns, continued prayers for Pastor Scott and his healing and his recovery? Anybody else? Well, let us pray. Oh, birthdays, sorry. Uh, are any of those having birthdays here today? Ashley, Stacy, Bob? Let us pray. Dear God, we do thank you for this beautiful day. The sun is trying to come out there and how just, what a difference that makes in our lives. So we thank you for the sun, we thank you for living in Minnesota, even though at times we may not always express that, but how fortunate and how blessed we are with the changing of the seasons and just seeing your creation in so many beautiful and wonderful ways. Dear God, we thank you for the people of this church and how they support each other and step up and help each other and do do. Maybe things that are that they might not do if Pastor Scott was here. So we appreciate for all this, the help and encouragement and extra work that is being done. We thank you for the children of this church and for the joy that they bring as they worship, as they go to Sunday school, and just as they are lovely children that they are. We thank you for being able to worship being able to worship in freedom, being able to let our love of you shine through, not just here, God, in the building, but as we go out into the world. 
Dear God, we do pray for the ugly situations that uh, take place in this world. We pray for peace and justice, that that can prevail. Dear God, we also pray for the unspoken requests that people have where you know our hearts and minds and our needs and you hear our prayers. We give you thanks and praise and ask all this in Jesus' name who taught us to pray. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And we continue in our worship by our offering. Amen. Go in peace, go in love. 